This episode is dedicated to the memory of our friend, Admiral Ampersand. Sick Boy Wolfgang Productions presents The Offering with Jerry Horror. A deep dive into the history of film and its filmmakers. Mostly horror, always genre. Eighties and nineties horror fans, it is time to rejoice. You've seen his work, you're a fan of his art, and now you can wear artist Mark Schoenbach's sadist art designs. If you're a fan of cult classic horror, you know his work. You've seen it everywhere, from the Halloween franchise to Pool Party Massacre. Whether it's at Slashback Video or Mac and Me, you will recognize his distinct style instantly. Now check out his latest stock, including R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike-inspired merchandise. Visit sadistartdesigns.com and put some respect on your swag. Nose Best Candles is a soy wax candle company owned by two Long Island natives turned Manhattanites. They hand pour small batches of cheeky candles that inspire the euphoric feeling of synesthesia. Each candle pairs an enchanting dual fragrance with a curated Spotify playlist to help you set your mood at home. Not to mention, the names of these candles are a conversation starter themselves. Best sellers include Bitch Goddess, Mountain Daddy, and Send Nudes. Their 2021 limited edition Halloween candle is named OMG I'm Dead. That's my favorite. The perfect scent to burn while enjoying your favorite horror podcast. Enjoy 10% off your candle haul this fall using the code JerryHara10. You can shop on NoseBestCandles.com. Again, 10% off any purchases using JerryHara10. Welcome to The Offering with Jerry Hara, the show where we can have a quiet and frank discussion as adults about the things that matter to me, or at least that I think matter to me. Please take a moment to subscribe to our show wherever you get fine podcasts, and hey, stay up to date on future episodes. This week on The Offering, we're talking all about the 1982 cult classic, Boarding House. gentlemen, friends beyond the binary, welcome to The Offering. But not just any old episode of The Offering, this is a very special episode. That's right, this is the homecoming episode, aka the Thanksgiving episode. You know, I'm thankful for a lot of things this year. Hopefully you get to spend time with your friends, your family, and all the people that you love, because that's all that matters, breaking bread with the people that are closest to us. Speaking of thankful, I'm thankful that I got to go back to cinemas this year. As an avid film nerd cinephile, you definitely need to have that theatrical experience. And most recently, the last film that I saw in theaters was Venom 2. Now, Venom 2 isn't going to win any Oscars. It's pretty obvious that it's a goop monster movie, and I'm fine with that. In fact, the movie itself, just to give you a quick review, perhaps even a hot take, it is a romantic comedy about Tom Hardy and a symbiote named Venom. This movie, it's bad. It's just like the other Venom, which was basically a 90s superhero movie. Like, you're watching it, it's kind of shades of Spawn. It's just like, oh, this is bad. You know that it's bad, but Tom Hardy saves it from mediocrity. And essentially, it's that romantic comedy. That's the A plot. And the B plot is Woody Harrelson as Carnage, Cletus Cassidy, and his hair keeps changing throughout the movie. And that's kind of distracting. There's also a point where Venom goes to a nightclub. And I was waiting for him to rap. I'm like, this is it. I'm like, it's Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze. I'm like, when is Venom? If Venom raps in this movie, I was like 10 out of 10. I'm like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. But it didn't happen. So whatever. It's also kind of like a Universal Monsters movie, very much with Sam Raimi did with Sandman in Spider-Man 3. 
they kind of go that route that Cletus Cassidy, um, obviously a serial killer, but also he has his lady love, which is Shriek. And there's just a bit of a horror element to that, that there's a bit of tragedy to the Cletus Cassidy character. Uh, It is what it is. I would honestly say it's a five out of 10. You could do worse, but you could do a lot better. I don't want to give away anything if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. So aside from the film, they have a cheap Tuesdays at the movie theater. My friend Jeremy and I decide, hey, it's cheap Tuesday. Let's go for a movie date. So we go, you know, obviously your seats now, the recliner seats, you, you can see that, okay, this is where my seats are. It's a system that's been put in place. We've been doing it for about a decade now. Reserved seating is not a new. It's not like, oh my God, we're you know we're taking spaceships back and forth to California. It's it's just reserved seating. It's like bingo with seats. So wouldn't you know it? There's some guy in Jeremy's seat. This guy's probably in his fifties. Looks like a real scumbag. And I got kind of a weird vibe from him. I'm like, ah, whatever. So Jeremy's like, my seat's supposed to be here, and says this very loudly, but this asshole's here. And I'm just like, okay. Jeremy does not have, I've learned a great deal of patience with people, and I'm just like, ah, whatever. I'm like, open rows, nobody else is there. So the guy looks at Jeremy like, oh, who's this guy? And I'm like, so, whatever. We sit down, and now Jeremy's sitting next to this guy, and it's completely awkward. Gets worse. I'm sitting to the left of Jeremy, And all of a sudden, I have to move over because a family shows up. And the family decides, you know, like they're going to sanitize the seats. So they're spraying like hand sanitizer and wiping things down. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. So I want to be a seat away from them. To make it even worse, it's a mother and two kids. And the kids are like teenagers. They're like 12, 13. And she has a dog. And I think it's like a medical dog. It's like a small little like Lassapoo type of thing. And I'm just like, come on. I'm like, you you fucking kidding me? Like, is this really happening? And this is why this is why people watch movies at home. OK, so Jerry decides to go out. It's a Tuesday night. God forbid I have a decent night outside of the house. The woman's got the dog. And so we move over and the guy doesn't want to move because now he has to shift over in these proposed seats that are not even his. And I'm not going to be bitch made. I'm not going to go to the management and say, hey, this guy's being in it. Because it'll turn into a thing. And I just want to watch my Goop Monster movie and move on with my night. So Jeremy says, hey, sir, you know, could you move? He doesn't say that. I say, excuse me, sir. Can you please move? There's a family here. Now, I'm going to clue you in. This is cluing in all my ops. Okay. If I say to you, please Sir, if I'm overtly nice to you, it means that I'm prepping you up just in case to punch you in the mouth. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if you're nice to somebody and you're in the right and you say, hey, I apologize or I'm sorry, please, thank you. And you're nice about it and you're clear in your words and make sure that everyone hears you because they'll say, he's really nice to the guy. And then he just started beating the shit out of him. This guy, not only was he going to get beat up by me, he was going to, because Jeremy had his beef prior to this he was ready to lay into this guy and now i'm ready to lay into him i'm like dude there's a family here they're cleaning stuff they got a dog i don't know what's going on somebody's gonna get an enema there's a food processor what's going on you need to move sir we start watching this movie the guy moves and i don't think he realizes but jeremy now wants to really beat his ass and i'm like you know what? I could totally throw this guy a beating right now. I'm like, I got a lot of problems in my life. You know, maybe this is a good way for me to ease my stress. So we get like 10 or 15 minutes into the movie and the guy just gets up. He walks out and never comes back. And I said to Jeremy, I'm like, that was the weirdest thing after the movie. What was the deal with that guy? All that bullshit. Was he homeless? Eh, It kind of didn't look homeless, but who knows? Uh, That would be very sad. And I would feel like an asshole. This guy was just, you know, posted up at the multiplex. So then I started thinking to myself, maybe he's, maybe he's like some kind of weird serial killer. And this is how he chooses people. So I say to Jeremy, I say, listen, dude, keep your eyes open. And this is, this is like half joking, half serious because I'm a paranoid person. And if it can happen, it will. 
So I said, you know, you never know. That guy could be waiting outside with a gun. So now I've got Jeremy on high alert as we're leaving the movie theater. We never saw him. We don't know what happened. Venom 2 was ridiculous. The post-trailer sequence was ridiculous. But one thing I told you, and I've mentioned this in previous episodes, one thing that pisses me off about all this Marvel stuff, there is a degree of it is a sexless and bloodless universe, which brings me to my next point. Films just aren't the same. And today we're talking about a hidden treasure that has finally come to Blu-ray. Big, nice set. We're going to talk all about that. Boarding House from 1982, which has all the blood. It's got all the sex. And that's what I'm talking about. It's fun. It's fun to go back and watch these movies. A lot of them, even if it's silly stuff, you know, from like the middle of the 80s, like Police Academy. There's sex, there's drugs, there's rock and roll, you know? Um, One of my favorites that I've rediscovered that was released by Shout Factory was Don't Stop the Music, which is the Village People movie with Steve Guttenberg. Very, very big Steve Guttenberg thing I'm going through right now. It is what it is. It's okay. It was cool, though, because there's a lot of dick in that movie. And I don't think that Boarding House has any schlong, but it's Got the lead star, John Wintergate, in a really awesome Speedo that's like a gold LeMay color. I mean, this is how we're opening. This dude is is doing yoga. He's got the gold LeMay Speedo. It's 1982. I can hear the cars playing, the Rick Ocasek cars. Yeah, it's a weird, weird movie. It's very surreal. Bleeding Skull, AGFA, just put out this fantastic set. Get it now while you can. If you're listening to this in the future, I don't know what to do. You could probably have to buy it off of eBay for 500 bucks. But if you hear this right now in the parameter of right now, go try and order it because it's a fantastic set. It's a film that everybody needs in their collection, especially if you're a serious horror collector. It's kind of one of those linchpin things that you pull out. You're like, yeah, I got boarding house. And your friends go, what is that? And that is where the real fun comes in because to the uninitiated, it is a weird and wild movie. I will even dare to say that there is a cinema verte transcendence happening because why I saw it the first time. Look, I know that I'm overselling it. I know that I'm too passionate, but I love this movie. I probably would not be doing this podcast without Boarding House. And the reason for that is, is that our our guest today, Sean, Sean King, he showed me this movie and it just blew my mind because it was one of those pieces of the puzzle that I had never seen we're going to get into it. It's going to be crazy. Are you following me on social media? It's at Jerry Hara. I hope that you and your family have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Tell all your friends I said hello. And let's get into this hot episode. Super special. Thanksgiving special. Homecoming. Boarding House 1982. transgressive, transcendent, and a portal into another time and place. That sums up this week's edition of The Offering. This is the homecoming Thanksgiving special. That that quote, the transgressive, transcendent, that's what I would put on the box of this movie. Uh, it's a weird movie. It's very divisive. My name's Jerry Hara, obviously. This is The Offering. This week's guest, whom I shall reveal quite shortly, uh, he showed me this film and it absolutely lit a fire under my ass uh, or rekindled the fire and the passion for cinema in general. So producer Pete always says one for me, one for them. Or I think we said that about Martin Scorsese, but this one's for me because this film, it's just coincidental that there is a new hot 2K restoration of this but let me i gotta do a little bit of table setting here folks because every good story starts with an introduction now it's 1982 boarding house is being made what's in cinemas what's the state of horror because we have to go back the biggest hit of the year for horror was poltergeist the possibly ghost directed by steven spielberg toby hooper joint it's iconic Probably made one of the biggest impressions on me. Clown was scary. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, previous episode. Definitely go back and listen to that. Don Dohler's Night Beast, another low-key masterpiece from that era. 
The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing, the film that kind of flopped, but in 2020, we all got to collectively experience The Thing. Nobody trusts anybody, and we're all very tired. I'm still very tired from 2020. Basket Case. Come on. It's Basket Case. Fantastic. Uh, uh, speaking of gimmick films, not quite horror vision, but Friday the 13th Part 3D, and I won't call it anything else. I won't call it Part 3. It's Part 3D. Uh, made a lot of dough, made a lot of scratch for Paramount. Silent Rage, which was the Chuck Norris vehicle where he fights a super bad foe who is a kind of a slasher villain. They give him Bluto. Uh, not Bluto. So I forget the actor's name, but he was the other fat guy. He was, uh, I don't know. I don't remember his name. It was Flounder? Yeah, it was Flounder. So they get Flounder from Animal House, and they put him with Chuck Norris, and they're in a slasher film. It works to mixed results. Not really. It's a good drive-in film. But to be perfectly honest with you, you could remake Silent Rage with, like, Jason Statham or Scott Adkins. It would work. Uh, Creepshow. I love Creepshow. Got Stephen King. Ooh, George Romero. Come on. It's Creepshow. Um, Pieces. I love me some pieces. Slumber Party Massacre. Uh, this is this is kind of the year where I think 81 is the peak of the slasher craze. So this is kind of it winding down. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit into my experience with Boarding House. Used to go to this uh, video store. This is in the 80s. Uh, show and Tell in Brentwood. Here in Long Island, New York. Here on Long Island, New York. I go to this video store. In their horror section, there was a wooden section that was up above, and it was all either movies that they didn't have anymore or movies that were really repugnant. I want to say it was way over my head. So this thing was clearly five or six feet in the air. Faces of Death 3 was on there. Uh, Demon Wind. Um, a copy of Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter that got ripped apart, so they put fake blood on it. This, I think they were trying to be cute and Boarding House. None of these films you could rent. They were gone, but they still wanted to use the boxes. Faces of Death 3 is a great box to display. I distinctively remember it because I would look up at it every time as a child. And I always wondered to myself, eventually I would see all of these films. I think Demon Wind, obviously. And then, you know, I'd go through the whole lot of them. I don't like the Faces of Death stuff. If you want to talk to me about that, I'll talk to you about how it was marketed. That's very interesting. But it's fucking repugnant, stupid shit that, yeah, nobody needs to watch it. It's it's garbage that's better left forgotten. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. If you own the IP, though, let me know because I, <laughs> I would be down to produce your new version of this. Where am I going with this? I never got to see Boarding House. I didn't see it, like I said, until about two years ago in 2019 when Sean King showed it to me. Blue Star presents... Boarding House. On September 18, 1972, the Hoffman House was closed due to several mysterious deaths. On September 18, 1982. Hi, how are you? Hello, Hi, I'm Cindy. Hi, Aunt Terry. Hi. Oh, what's this? Yeah, I'm glad my brother told me about this place. Yeah. The house was reopened as a boarding house. And the body count continues. I wonder who will be next to check out of the boarding house. Kill you, but something else will. <laughs> Boarding house rated R. No one under 17 admitted without parent or guardian. In Horror Vision, a Coast Films release. To that effect, I'd like to introduce filmmaker, producer, and distributor of this new Boarding House disc, which is brought to you by AGFA. And Bleeding Skull. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hi, Sean. How you doing today? I'm great, Jerry. Thank you for having me on. And it's an honor to be with you on spring break. 
I can't go back, I, you know, I can't wait to go back to school. But while I'm home, I love talking about Boarding House. Let me tell you about Boarding House. You showed me this movie, and I will implore the listeners right now. If you have not seen this film, I'm not saying shut this off, but I am kind of saying shut it off and go watch Boarding House. Go order the, go order the Blu-ray. Yeah, that's the thing, okay? There's been many releases of this movie since 1982. Theatrical, home video, a lot of different formats, a lot of different titles, a lot of different countries put this out. But this new one from Agfa Bleeding Skull that you can get on VinegarSyndrome.com is by far the definitive remastered multi-version, multi-cut with a bonus film, a second film by Callisu and John Wintergate that never got released called Sally and Jess. Uh, this is the complete package right here if you're a Boarding House fan or a soon-to-be Boarding House fan. Get this disc. It's We worked so hard on it. It's a great collection, and it's, um, yeah, you, you don't want to miss out on getting it because you're going to be spending two or $300 on it in the uh, scalper market in a couple of years. So get it now. Yeah. Again, this is a divisive film. Either you get it or you don't. That's fine. Just get it to so say you got it. How, you oh, know? well, I've told you'll I, be cooler. I told people in the in the introduction, I explained to them that this is something that you need in your collection. It's a cornerstone. <laughs> uh, look. I hate when I love something. I know that sounds terrible, but because it's all I can talk about. And Boarding House is one of these films that you showed me, and it's a bizarre film. Okay, now, I also have to preface this, which I didn't. The VHS and the Beta War was roaring on. We grew up during the Cold War, but the VHS Beta War was strong. Now, this film in particular, okay, this is, it just blows me away. The, the whole story of it, I, I don't know what it is. There's some kind of strange attraction I have to the there whole. Are, there are stories. There are great stories. Okay. So this film, again, I'm prefacing. I can't stop setting the table. This film was shot on video, and then it is blown up to film, which was unheard of at the time. Right? Yeah. This was shot on three-quarter inch videotape in... 1981-82 it's a bit foggy people are at an age where it's kind of the memories and the conditions of making it the habits they had kind of make the memories a little hazy which translate directly to the movie itself so 1981-82 it comes out 82 gets distributed by a company called coast films and the three-quarter inch videotape which they shot Soap operas on the mm. news. I worked on it when I was kind of doing stuff. TV production. That's right. what you cut your teeth on editing. This was pre VHS, pre consumer VHS. This was, like you said, this was the VHS beta wars were just beginning. The filmmakers of Boarding House realized they didn't have the funds to shoot it on film, mm. but they had video equipment. They worked in television, music, film. So they had the three quarter inch camera, they shot it on that got distributed on 35 millimeter. They struck somewhere between, again, these details are kind of hazy, between 200 and 500 prints that got distributed in the United States in theaters. So it's a video movie you're watching on film in a theater. The legend goes that this was the most (laughs) widely seen shot on video film uh, to play in theaters. Yeah. And, And think about it now. Every movie you see pretty much... Nine out of ten movies you're going to go to the theater to see is a shot on video movie. It's TV. Yeah, yeah it, well, it's, it's you know it's it's digital video, but it's it's still this was light years ahead of any of that. You know, Sean, it's it's just content. At the end of the day, it's uh, <laughs> now it's content. That's what yeah, they tell I'm me. Sure, They're yeah. just you know you're a content creator. Uh, well, uh, Very broad term. This was content too because this was a time like you said the slasher era was kind of. Declining. It was it was dragged out at this point, and this kind of I could even you could even make the argument I will a little bit I'll mention it. This is kind of post. This is the beginning of post horror. Mm. This is the beginning of new wave movie making. Porn did the same thing at this time, early eighties. New wave porn came in. This movie has porn vibes because the porno was shot on tape, not blown up to 35 millimeter and shown in theaters, but they went straight to video. After Boarding House, some filmmakers realized, oh, we can shoot home movies, home video 
movies made for home video release on videotape. But this one predated that by going straight to theaters first, which was really weird at the time. Ultimately, ultimately, uh, VHS versus beta VHS wins largely because of people like Marilyn Chambers pornography. This was this goes back even further. It it gets echoed into the future where HD the, the HD discs don't survive and, right. and Blu-ray yeah. flourishes because of pornography. The, the format wars were so much fun. If you <laughs> if you at that time, if you weren't filming Jimmy's bar mitzvah and you were shooting on beta, you're shooting on VHS in 1982. People are just assume you're associated with pornography. Well, if, if you had a high end camera, you were a news person or a, a porno producer. But the thing is, the weird thing about beta versus VHS was most of us know that beta was the superior format quality wise, but the VHS recorded a half an hour more on the same size tape. The 1980, so. <laughs> the 1982 version of me, the fat guy who would be working at a video store in 82 would sell me on beta. He, yeah. That's what I, I'd yeah. be like. Oh well, you know, beta, it's the sound, everything. It's just it's better. It's a better quality thing. But it's again, pornography and sports usually kind of determine the the way things are going to go. This film you gets know? gets its official release on home video in eighty three, or was it eighty four? Officially on video, uh, nineteen eighty two. Ariel Video put it out uh, under the title House Geist, which was the same year as Poltergeist. Hmm. And there are really no similarities between the two except, you know, the exploitation. You change the movie's name to whatever's popular at the theater. Uh, 1985, 1984, it goes out uh, theatrically on 35 millimeter film. Stays out for three, four months. Mm. Uh, it goes to video on in 1985. But between all of this, between 1982 and 1985... The uh, producer, Howard Willett, the distributor, I'm sorry, of Coast Films, dies. Mm. All of the library of Coast Films goes to his widow and then gets lost. The rights gets lost. Um, the rights do not go back to Callisoo and John Wintergate, the producers. Oh. And it gets um, bootlegged, duplicated all over the world. Uh, in so many countries, it's kind of, you can't list them all. And so the last really official one was the Paragon VHS tape. And, um, and then it, years later, it came out on DVD. Mm. But, uh, Code Red put it out, and then Slasher Video put it out, and now uh, Agfa Bleeding Skull through Vinegar Syndrome. This is, th- if you're, let me tell you something, folks. If you're going to watch this movie, this is the release you've kind of been waiting for. Um, well, then maybe they don't know about Boarding House because this is um, they're well, yeah, <laughs> it's most, a weird one, Jerry. Most be, again, you know, if you see this film, the effect that it had on on me was just who are these people? Who are these people? Is this Southern California? Where are we? What's going on? Wow, there's a lot of hot babes in this movie. This is what the average layman is going to come into this film. I feel that it's very accessible. Uh, you talked about obviously Sledgehammer. Um, I love Sledgehammer. I think it's fantastic. But for my money, I think that Boarding House is the. It's just such a weird movie. It for some reason it's like it's trippy. Should we? Speaking of trippy, going back to the old William Castle ways, where you kind of huckstered people. There was always you know some kind of Glowavision, yep. Skellavision. They do horror vision. Yeah, in this yeah. Film. They were inspired by that. The the distributor was. Inspired by that and thought of Horror Vision, which was basically just a warning that would come on screen and a sound, a synthesizer sting sound. And it was an image of a black glove mm. flexing out and these kind of weird video artifacty vibrations coming out of the, the, the gloved hand. And it, it was a cool analog video effect. And it's even cooler when you see it in film. That was the kind of the barf bag given to you or the the tingler effect. Mm. So when you saw the horror vision clip, you close your eyes and look away and cover your ears. Yeah, it's funny because it serves almost as a warning to the audience. Like, hey, some freaky shit's about to happen. But the whole movie's freaky. The whole fucking movie is freaky. So it's, it's let me tell you about when I saw it for the okay. first time and, and my introduction to it. It was uh, 2018, 
and there was a there was a trash movie uh, marathon at the Alamo Draft House in Yonkers, and I forgot I I, I forgot who did it. It was Exhumed Films. Mm. It may have been Exhumed Films. It sounds on brand. And uh, they they didn't tell you what the the lineup was. We sat through a bunch of great movies, and then Boarding House comes on, and you're immediately the the first impression you have is this kind of what was that dot matrix kind of type that green type on the monitor that comes up oh yeah and it's like dos yeah it's this dos type that comes up uh as a case file of the that leads you into the story of the movie and uh accompanied by these beeps that are supposed to be the letters typing mm. you know in movies they always had that you know the country you're in and you know what the plane is going here and it's just they they have these these beeps that coincide with the type that are just beep 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 and it just goes on and it's on grating. and on it's grating and when you think the type stops it comes back again mm. and the beep is louder now this is it okay we know the case file let's get into the movie no there's another block of text and the beep comes back immediately you're you're 2 minutes into this movie People are covering their ears because of the beeps are so annoying and everybody's just cracking up yeah. because the beeps won't let up. Nope. <laughs> they keep coming and you never saw type like that. And then you go into the prologue of the movie and you notice that this doesn't look like film so much. It looks like old video that was converted to film that you would see in a documentary in the 1970s or early 80s or something like that. There's a motion blur to the image behind a print that has been beaten up over time. Well loved, as Joe Ziemba of, of Bleeding Skull says. And there's scratches on the video. There's film grain. You're just like, what am I watching? What layer should I be paying attention to? It's like an eye test almost. Mm. And, it, and the colors bleed. Shadows are grainy. The title treatment is all analog video from 1982 and you just immediately you know you're not watching anything that <laughs> resembles anything you've ever seen before the other thing too is when you see that you know like i believe it was john wintergate the lead's life um john wintergate looks a lot like david lee roth uh, oh yeah man. big yeah, david yeah, yeah. lee roth van halen era <laughs> vibes but when you see yeah. on the screen it says uh classo you think to yourself Kalisu, yeah, Kalisu. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, i think to myself i'm like is this like shares evil doppelganger yeah. like it's like who because i feel like that was a big deal in the 80s where you had one name sure well, I, well to 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 really set the set the table properly as you would say uh the filmmakers behind this are a husband and wife team uh who are musicians and had um many bands from the 60s to the 90s i, I believe they're probably still making music today her name is Callisu and his name is john wintergate they pretty much together put Boarding House together. Their personalities are all over it. To go back to my introduction, I saw in the theater, I always knew about Boarding House because the it was always one of those titles on the video store rack where it was, you know, Sorority House Massacre, Poltergeist, Slumber Party Massacre, this, you know, Don't Go in the House. It was one of those housey kind of like warning, don't go in this house movie. Got to do it. You yeah. got to do it. But the, but it got lost in all of those kind of slasher, supernatural horrors of that time. Pete Bune, the producer of this podcast and a producer of another podcast that I was a part of called the Pitch It Movie Podcast. We had on some friends of ours from a long time ago named Greg Antonito and Shanti Wintergate. Mm. Shanti Wintergate, Greg's wife, being the daughter of Callisu and John Wintergate. It wasn't so much a coincidence, but yeah. it was like when you hang out with cool people who go to do cool things, you're in that kind of clique of people who do cool things. Shanti does cool things. Greg has a band called The Bouncing Souls he's had for years. Oh, yeah. Shanti is a musician, an actor. She's been in like the Hollywood scene for, for since she was – she's in boarding house when she's like two years old. She's a little kid in the background. So – Shanti says on the podcast, well, Greg prompts Shanti on our podcast. I forgot what episode it was. It was called Movie Party, the Pitcher Movie Podcast, Movie Party episode. And Greg says, tell, tell them about uh, Boarding House. 
And Shanti says, oh, okay, well, my parents made a movie called Boarding House that was the first shot on video movie to get transferred to film and shown in theaters. Mm. I knew, I was like, oh my God, I know Boarding House. I'm familiar with that movie. Shanti tells the story of the production of the movie, how it became, in, in New York, it would, it would be shown in theaters a lot. It would be shown in California and New York in the, theatrically. Her favorite story was Vincent Gallo, another filmmaker, underground filmmaker, but he's had some success in, in mainstream. Brown Bunny. Brown Bunny, Get, Buffalo 66, you know. uh, some Abel Ferrar movies, I think, forgot. But, Vinny Gallo. Yeah, Vinny. You know Vinny. New Come York on. staple. You know Vinny. So another New York staple, Joey Ramone was friends with Vincent Gallo. One of their favorite things to do together was to watch their VHS copy of Boarding House. It was one of Joey Ramone's favorite movies. And then Shanti saw Vincent Gallo a few years after that. And he, he went to a screening in L.A. in 2013 and told her that story uh, in person. So, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I think whenever I watch a movie, the first thing that I do is, especially when you're watching movies that are outside of the studio system, and Boarding House is the most fucking outside of the studio system you can imagine. And the first thing I say whenever I watch a movie, uh, whether it's Evil Dead, it doesn't matter what it is. Also, side note, side note, um, everything now is so fucking homogenized because, again, it's content. It's not cinematic. It's well, it's very it's, safe. Yeah, well, it, it's... This you can make the argument here, okay? Uh, everything is everything is a trend, right? Um, we're stuck in this trend now of art house horror, uh, where there's some really great stuff, and then there's some really transparently kind of like run of the mill stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of indie stuff happening, mm. and a lot of the indie stuff tries to ape the style of this studio e a twenty four folky art house stuff. Yeah. Boarding House was just doing the same thing with the exploitation movies back then. So it was it was a labor of love, sure. But everybody kind of wants to jump on that trend and it becomes content. Does it or does it stay kind of uniquely theirs? Boarding House you definitely feels very uniquely a piece of art from a group of people who have a specific uh, way to do things. The first time... I watch any movie, as I said previously, I say to myself, who are these people? Who are they? What's right. their story? And I'm watching this film and I'm thinking, I've already got things in my head. I'm like, they probably own a yoga studio. I'm like, I, I, oh, get, yeah. I get big yeah. yoga vibes and then uh -huh. I, I get, because I can smell my own, you get swinger vibes, you get, you get everything. You're saying to yourself, oh, these these broads are pretty foxy. Maybe maybe they're doing the smut, you know? Right. Yeah, you don't quite know if they came off the porno set at noon and then went to the boarding house set and double dip that day. You know, you don't, that's the vibe you get. San, it, it, that's definitely the vibe. Where you the get. hell? Okay. And again, you look at it. The pool. It looks very Casa San Fernando Valley. Where the hell do you oh, know where this I, film? Oh, I. It, it's in the valley somewhere. There you um, go. That's all you that, need to the, say. The house was. Well, let, let's talk about quickly. Just I'm going to run down just the, the quick synopsis. There's a psychic gigolo type named Jim. He inherits a house. He rents it out to any available single woman that will come and rent a room. And suddenly he moves in. All the rooms are filled. There is at least a half a dozen model types living in the boarding house. None of them really seem to have any jobs it's a sitcom. It's, it's it, literally it's, a sitcom. It's it, yeah. Imagine uh, you know Three's Company, but it's more like you know Eight or Nine's Company. The man's got and, a harem. Uh, he's got a harem. Okay, <laughs> just there's no. He's got a harem. Well, just just do a quick Google search of John Wintergate and Boarding House, and you'll see this striking individual. Uh, Great value Sting. Yeah. What what of <laughs> Sting? David Lee Roth. Uh, a blend of those guys, but one of the most iconic images is. He plays a psychic who's practicing telekinesis. And to finish the synopsis, one of the residents of the boarding house is a, a psychic telekinetic enemy who's trying to retake the house that she grew up in. And it all, it, it all culminates into a, um, a telekinetic psychic vibe war between Jim and the, um, 
the resident Debbie Hoffman, who has also practiced in the art of telekinetic. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. that's, the, that's, that's boarding house. But that's not what makes it great. That's great. And that's what you said. Like this new agey thing from the 70s, early 80s definitely creeps its way in. The yogi thing, the, the spirituality, the Middle Eastern, uh, all of that stuff. Which which the Winter Gates still practice still today and they're very dedicated to. God, so that bl- God bless them yeah, too. No, they're glad to hear that. They're beautiful. Their yeah. their outlook on everything is really great, and it's just like, it's just so cool to use that metaphysical spirituality into a supernatural horror movie. And it's like, I can't really remember anything that did it before. You know, I'm I'm sure it's been done since, but it's just. It's so adorable and so unique and weird, and it works so well in Boarding House because the cast is so good. And John and Callisoo are just such a such cool creators in it, and they have these amazing moments. Um, it's an ambrosia of a movie. It's so yeah. it's everything because a lot of times with the plot points of Boarding House, you could say to yourself, "Okay, it's about a, a psychic guy." That's full stop. That's its own movie. That, yeah, that's a Nicolas Cage movie in the mid '90s, but. No, 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 wait, there's more, but wait, there's more. He rents a house. I feel there's a cut, and I feel like you guys should have done this. I'm going to probably give people ideas, whatever, where you cut the opening of like a, a 70s, early 80s sitcom, but with Boarding House. Oh, yeah, that could totally work. Right? Yeah. Especially those early 80s ones that were shot on, like like Three's Company, where it was a bunch of kind of free-loving people, and it was shot on video, and it was just kind of production values really weren't there. And it just kind of has a, 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 just a glimmer of sleaze on it, like a kind of a slight coating of sleaze, like Three's Company had, you know. And a lot of those are early sitcoms that were kind of transgressive, you know. But Boarding House has the added benefit of just being completely incoherent. The narrative is incoherent because the filmmakers shot a lot more footage that didn't make it into the final cut because they intended it to be a, a spoof mm. of those movies. And I think, I'm not quite sure when Student Bodies came out. 81. Wacko. Yeah, so there th- that was trending too because, like, as you said, slasher movies and all that stuff was kind of, like, running its course and they started spoofing that stuff because there was so much of a glut that producers had to do something different. So they started making them comedies. Got to Saturday the 14th. All Airplane, yeah. it just hit too. So Right, yeah. So this kind of absurd comedy, this was intended to be that, but the distributor figured it would be better to make it a straight horror movie, cut most of the comedic elements out, and now you have these gaps of tone and logic in the movie that benefit it that more than you can even imagine. Like, I, I don't want to see the comedy version of this movie. No. I just want to see the version where the comedy was gutted and every and there's no connective tissue to any of the logic. <laughs> Some of the women come and go... Um, you can tell there's complete there's there's fade outs in the middle of scenes, abrupt fades. Love it. And then another disconnected scene begins after it. You kind of start shaking your head and wondering if you're if it's an illusion, it's a dream, and you can't f- quite figure out what you're watching. And it doesn't take long to get there. It takes it, about 15 minutes yeah. until you're completely lost, but you just like you just kind of succumb to the to the sur- surreality of it and you just, you know, because you've never seen anything like it. It's an oddball. And I say that in the most affectionate way that I possibly can. Yeah. Oh, the filmmakers would say the same thing because they know what they have, you know. Look, I don't want to be like I'm suckling at the teat too hard. But for me, I think the greatest compliment and what I'm searching for in a movie now, uh, you know, as a 43-year-old man, what I'm looking, I'm looking for those big experiences. And in the last decade via movie theaters, I haven't had any of those experiences. I'm looking for a film. Sean will have his bad movie night. He'll show some some movies. And I want that movie where I just go, what? Are you serious? Where yeah. I'm just like, is this really happen? Like where even though everybody knows I love THC, I need something on top of that. I need like the Donkey Kong sledgehammer over the head where it's like, oh, wait, there's more. I don't like the director's cut of this film. Not a fan. Um, not a fan at all. No, there's not many that do, um, which is kind of irritating because... It's it's frustrating to watch it because this was a, another cut made by John Wintergate, I think, in 2010. But it was cut on a Windows laptop yeah. with Windows Movie Maker with really irritating cross fades and transitions and titles. 
but it was a cool opportunity to put a lot of those scenes back that got cut out, the comedy and the kind of, um, they delve into character stuff, which in Boarding House, you don't really need to go deep into character motivation and things. So it's way better without that. Yeah, it's out there on Slasher. Slasher Video put out a DVD in, I think, 2014 that has that cut on it. It's it's long out of print, and it's for the completists, really. That's about it. I will tell you, folks, probably won't come up, but if you have the chance to watch it, probably avoid it. It's one of those things where if you love it, seek it out. But for the most part, uh, here's what I will say, and this is one testament to this film. Here on The Offering, we are proponents of the 90-minute movie. I like my movies lean. Like you tell me about, you know, 1990, Death Warrant with Jean-Claude Van Damme. What happens? Jean-Claude Van Damme knows karate. He goes to prison. That's it. Yeah. yeah. 90 minute movie, yeah. 87 minutes. No, you're the, in and you're out. The synopsis should take you 30 to 35 seconds to say. And uh, and that's it. And that's, Boarding House is kind of make, hard to make a synopsis of, but boiling it down. Erwin yeah, Yablons, that's, that's uh, notorious producer of Halloween. He basically said, he's like, and he was a guy who was selling in the drive-ins and, and selling to the early dawn of the multiplex. Mm-hmm. And he said, you have to tell a distributor or whoever is screening the film, you basically have to be able in one sentence to sum it up. Right. I think what it is, is like you said, the movie got edited again from the comedy and it becomes a much more accessible film. Yeah. And it's lean, yeah. even when it's meandering, like the whole thing with the with the, the typing, which is just ter- which is hysterical in some ways. Well, well yeah, it, it's... This movie is at its best when watched with a crowd and watched um, under, under the, the influence, influence of, yeah. of whatever your choice is. Definitely. We'll be right back with more of The Offering with Jerry Horror. You've seen these guys at all the horror shows and comic cons. Now you can get your very own inked up merch, the finest in embroidered horror and sci-fi themed merchandise. From Lost Boys to Street Trash, from Chopping Mall to Cobra Kai, inked up has the best in embroidered beanies, baseball caps, and patches. Now they've even got their own Jaws inspired Amity Island board shorts. You gotta take a look, these things are cool. Visit their Etsy store at etsy.com slash shop slash inked up merch. Are you looking to get your own printed or embroidered merch? Inked up has been in business for over 10 years. Whether you're looking for merch for your band or you need crew logo shirts and hats for your first film production. You need some sick looking perks for your Kickstarter project. Inked up can accommodate your needs with their custom silk screen printing and embroidery services. Visit inkedupmerch.com and tell them Jerry sent you. Monster lovers, young and old, living and dead. You can now make it Halloween all year round. The Gooligans are dying for you to check out their creepy comedy horror show now on their YouTube channel. Have you been ravenous for programs that are geared more towards your sick sensibility? Have you been fiending for horror and comedy so fun that it makes you want to scream? Well, dig no further. Full episodes of the Gooligans miniseries are available for you to sink your teeth into. And if you don't know about the Gooligans, it's like the monkeys meets the monsters meets Pee Wee's Playhouse. These fun party monsters exist purely to bring on the death of your life-sucking, normal, everyday TV show. The Gooligans follows the adventures of Boris Stein, the monstrous Frankenstein construct, Wolfgang W. Wolfgang, the likable lycanthrope, and Boy, king of the slow zombies, joined by a cadre of your favorite cult cretins, including vampires, sea creatures, luchadors, and sexy go-go girls. Check out the full episodes of their miniseries now on the Gooligans YouTube channel and have a scary good time. You're listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. Got a question or a story you want to share with me? It might be featured in a future episode. Email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter at jerryhara. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there at jerryhara. 
rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts, and you might find your review in an upcoming episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Offering. Now back to the show. Blue Star presents Boarding House in Horror Vision. Forget 3D and experience a new dimension in screen terror. For Horror Vision, you don't need glasses, only a strong heart. At one time, the Hoffman House was just like any ordinary house, until an evil force became a resident. Power to possession. And unleashed its terror. Death stalks even in the dreams of all who enter the boarding house. The rent won't kill you, but something else will. Boarding house in horror vision. Rated R. I can watch it on my own endless times because I'm just constantly amused by it. It's what, time and place. If it's your first voyage into boarding house, yeah, go along with a couple of buddies, some refreshments. That's what we lost during the pandemic where everybody couldn't go to movie theaters. People were yeah. afraid to have yeah. guests over. We lived through it. Uh, yeah. People forget uh, film is such a communal experience. Especially when it's something like this. Yes. Because Hell yeah. You can watch. I mean, I, I watch Dune at my house. You know, I mm. have I have a nice theater set up, but I kind of wanted to go to the theater and Me watch too. Dune with a bunch of people like I used to. Mm. You know, to hear people gasp or cheer or whatever like that. I mean, the last time I had that was Avengers Endgame where people were cheering along and everybody was respectfully watching the movie and not distracted with their devices and all this other stuff. The reality of it is, is that now, again, going back to the homogenization of modern content, we lose. Okay, this was just shot in a, you know, on a set in a back lot. It's all or, or a digital or, a, or an, a virtual set now, or a green or screen, which which is <laughs> which LED screens or everything is going to have the same processed feel of the Mandalorian, which looks great, but people are going to notice it just like CGI or practical effects soon. You know, films that take place in contemporary times are more and more rare. Even when you watch a film like Goodfellas, it's the passage of time. We're going to different eras. But what I love about this movie is that it shows it's a time and a place yeah. and it wears it on its sleeve. Even from Wintergate is wearing a, a thin tie. And I said to myself, I'm like, that's something that like Rick Ocasek would wear in a Cars music. Video. Oh, this is and I'm so like, oh. it's so music video. 1982 new wave. Mm. Yeah, it's all of that stuff. I love it. Yeah. And it's very specific time and place. And the motivation of the movie is very specific and clear. That's kind of something that we lost, the non-self-aware, non-ironic, quote-unquote, bad movie. And I, I, don't, I hate to say bad movie because there's, there's really not... A, no. a bad movie to me is just a boring movie. Yeah. And most of the things in theaters are just boring, bad movies. This is a... I mean, if you're in the right frame of mind, this is a very entertaining, non-bad movie. You can mock it. You can make fun of it. We kind of lost the art of that. After, I think it was kind of around the time where DVD came in, the 90s, it kind of started to fade. But throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, you had movies that were made by entrepreneurial people like the Wintergates here. They didn't have access to the system. They didn't have the right tools. They didn't have the right education for it, maybe. I'm not saying specifically they didn't or, or anybody did. But overall, that kind of naivete and that charm got lost somewhere in the 90s and then filmmakers became self-aware when tim burton makes ed wood mm. everybody's in on the joke suddenly yeah and it kind of loses the charm of most of that stuff that's why we go back to 1978 1982 1988 that's when we go back that's why we go back to that era to find that charming stuff that was kind of ignorant about itself 
I warn people about this because sh- you you even you're a proponent of it, the shot on video stuff, because what happens is it's just like when you get high for the first time on anything, you're chasing the dragon. Yeah. So it's like once you get into this shot on video genre, uh, whether you're a horror fan or you're just a fan of movies, it, you go down a rabbit hole. And I will oh, yeah. say, again, Sledgehammer and Boarding House are the cream of the crop of that genre. Yeah, I mean, both have the both have the kind of the um, the notoriety of uh, Boarding House being the first shot on video shown theatrically. Sledgehammer was the first shot on video made exclusively for the home video market. And those set a trend, as you said, of the SOV Hmm. shot on video movies. It's just, it's absolutely crazy to see. It's like when people tell you like, oh, I'm into metal. Well, are you into doom metal, black metal, death metal, thrash metal? Because I think that the internet in some ways was the great equalizer about fans worldwide finding out about their favorite films and being able to share and exchange this information, again, it's a double-edged sword, but one good thing was that more people got to see this film. And it's mm-hmm. crazy because people are going to hear this show and they're going to be able to... This is something they might not know about. Like this last season, we did the whole Dimension Pictures thing. For better or worse, uh, somebody had to explore it, so why not me? I dug it. It's great. Uh, thank you. But the reality of it is, is that Boarding House is just... Such a weird movie. I mean, some people, they say, well, uh, you know, it was the Stanley Kubrick films. Like my parents would say, seeing a clockwork orange. Mm -hmm. It was just this weird experience. Mm -hmm. Boarding House is weird, man. It's trippy. Like, it's really out there. And I've seen this film. I've seen this film under the influence of many things. And it just, can I just ask you a question? Can I I feel like I'm having the Chris Farley, uh, Paul McCartney (laughs) moment here. (laughs) That was cool. Can I ask you a question about, uh, okay, so... One thing, there's this old guy who appears throughout this film. He's got to be drunk. That's number one. Yeah. But oh, yeah, yeah. He's yes, like, yes, he's like yes. one of these guys who was like, I was on, I was on Mayberry. I, you know, I was. Oh, yeah. He's an old. T- oh, you can can't tell. I remember his name. Um, yes. But he, he was. Uh, oh, he was an old Hollywood guy. Yeah. Yeah. Get that vibe. Like and, I worked in vaudeville when I was five. But it was one of those things where, you, you know, you're a producer on low budget Westerns or science fiction, giant monster movies, atomic age, 50s, 60s. Going into the seventies with the creature features, and then you see the the theatrical kind of go into the drive-in, mm. and then these people were around to see the drive-in fade into the video store. So they had to change with the times, but the best ones are the ones that really didn't quite know how to transition properly mm. and still use those old techniques in this new kind of uh, this new arena of digital. Or home video, or even the drive-in stuff. I mean, you know, they, they tried to adapt to the drive-in, the exploitation, and some of it was so clunky. And H.G. Lewis and all those guys were just kind of, again, they were just learning as they went. And luckily for us, we, we get to see that kind of like, that awkward kind of birth of this stuff. It Video people, again, a lot of our listeners probably weren't even born then. The reality of it is, is that you go back and... VHS, beta, three quarter inch, allowed people who would never have access to a 35 millimeter camera. Right. Yeah. So many of our films, how many of our favorite films were shot seminally on 16 millimeter? Uh, and then you get into some of the eight millimeter stuff yeah. Yeah. and it gets funky. It just gets weird. And then you and I, yeah, listeners, you, you don't know this, but Jerry and I know each other for a long time. Oh, yeah. And we, <laughs> and we, yeah. we met in high school. Here on Long Island, and then we started making movies on VHS tape. That's right. And this was when VHS was maybe ten or twelve years into its kind of like commercial yeah. use, where where maybe when we were in high school or middle school, families it was it was kind of the average thing for a family to have just now to have a VCR, and if they were really kind of well off, they had a video camera. And another cool thing too in the '90s and later on into the '90s, when the late '90s, early 2000s was you mentioned the internet and the, the connectivity of people and the sharing of information people were able to find a copy of a movie like boarding house or uh, some other thing that wasn't really kind of like was far out of print and a thing of legend that there was forums about deep deep in the like not the dark web but the deep web kind of thing and you would buy there would be ads in the back of fangoria where you can buy you buy these tapes, these bootlegs, you can trade tapes. These are TV movies that were not on VH, not put on VHS or, or long out of print. So 
that kind of sharing really kind of started the era we're in now where these where a movie like Boarding House can get a two disc deluxe set that is better than or as good as any studio release can put out. It's unbelievable quality. The print of the slip cover, the quality of the transfers and the treatment of the sound is just it's ridiculous. A lot of us, especially children of the 80s, experienced our first erotic awakenings via VHS pornography. Yeah. I saw I was in a basement of seven or eight other boys and I saw a taboo, the first taboo. And man, did it leave an impression. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the secret to anything from the early 80s, anything shot on video. There is a very pronounced sense of forbidden. There's something yes, here you right, are not yes. supposed to see. Yes, that's that's a great point, and that's what Boarding House feels like. It feels like something that slipped out of some other some other dimension that you you were not supposed to see. Yep. Just like when you're watching that first forbidden thing, if it was porn, if it was horror, mm. that your parents were just trying to hide from you. It feels like you're looking into a window that just looks into a different dimension that was not supposed to be open for you to see into it. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a little story. This is where we veer hard rate because, you know, it's time for another ridiculous thing. So all the mom and pops have closed. It's the early 90s. And I get a job with my friend of the show, Maddie P. Maddie P. Oh, boy. How do I preface this? Maddie P. and I are working at Blockbuster Video. And uh, he always says, it's actually from Twin Peaks, but he always says it, is that your favorite flavor of bubblegum will come back into style, <laughs> which is very much the, the case with all of these video releases we've gotten. Everything gets a special edition. Yeah. Nothing is left untouched. We're working at Blockbuster. Somebody returns a tape. It's this family that comes in all the time. They return a tape. I, I check the tape and I'm like, it's blank. I'm like, you know, usually you have like, oh, it's Die Hard 2 or The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. It's got the sticker on the face. Yeah, and the yeah. Stamp. Be kind. Rewind. No. So I put this in and it's basically this these two, the customers, it's the husband and the wife, and they're at a hotel with what appears to be a prostitute. Wow. Hottest thing I've ever seen. Forbidden. Shot on VHS. Go back to Matty P's wow. house. He's He's got, come on, it's the early 90s. We've got those, the double VCRs. We make some copies for ourselves. <laughs> so for whatever reason, we brought it back to the blockbuster. The husband and the wife come in, like, I want to say a few days later. And the wife oh looks God. ghostly white. She says, hi, we returned to tape the other day. And what insult to injury, it was a children's tape. It was like a children's movie that had gotten. So somewhere so along. So when they the, taped over like a kid's movie? Yeah. No, no, no. Somewhere along the lines, they had returned what was to be a copy of, of Home Alone that had their sex oh, tape in okay, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, luckily, we brought it back to the store and I gave it to her and she was very thankful. But. Did you give their review? Uh, the no, review? no. Oh, we were, yeah. you know, we were still young. We were embarrassed. You know, it's like, I, you know, I just, uh, I, I. Yeah, I took this tape home and I, you know, I, I know everything about you. And and you know what? Here's the thing. I am not one to judge. And I think that's great. And you know what's even better? Even though we weren't supposed to be watching it, there is that thrill. And yeah. that is, again, we talk about what that chasing that dragon, mm -hmm. seeing those forbidden VHS images. Right. Yeah. I, I Maybe this this age is so amazing where we can have boarding house. We can have. Kevin Tenney's The Cellar, The Laughing Dead. We can have these movies that are long out of print or never previously released, given the top shelf treatment, the best treatment that a movie release can get on home video. But finding those weird tapes in the woods, in the garbage, Ooh. you know, or return to, you know, that sex tape that got returned to it, blockbuster we, we talked about this in private with some friends yeah, that, uh that, woods porn when yeah. you find pornography in the woods yeah i yeah i mean we were just joking about that yesterday we were like what do they leave now they leave like you know uh, ipads you know um not, what, do they, what do they do what do kids leave in the woods as, as far as pornography there was that thrill there was that forbidden quality of of getting a tape and not knowing what's on it Boarding House still feels that way where you're just like, how did how did this movie get to this level? I'm very curious. How did this movie got this kind of treatment? It got here. Something's really wrong with the world, but it's perfect when this happens. Well, 
it, it's kind of like I equate a lot of these films. It's kind of like Toy Story where you have these toys that have been misplaced and they haven't been loved. Yeah, yeah. You guys really dusted off this this film and we're like, okay, we're going to give it a good home. Well, yeah, because they know that there's three to five thousand people out there that will either blind buy it or they've been waiting for it to go back into print and get the A-plus treatment that Vinegar Syndrome can do or, or AGFA can do. It's a great time. But, you know, us middle-aged folks have the benefit of going through that mysterious blank tape era, that tape trading, underground tape trading thing where you would trade bootlegs or go to go to Fangoria Weekend of Horrors in oh. 1993 and buy that thing that was so out of print. Or you may have heard somebody say once that it was a thing of legend. So, like, it's so cool to live through that and then now revisit these things and buy them and put them on a shelf and kind of as a trophy and you just have like the best version of it. It's great. Hey, I mean, as a film fan, it's the greatest time to be alive. It is. Yeah. And, you know, thank you to everybody uh, at AGFA, Bleeding Skull, you guys. I yeah, just This yeah. isn't even the end of the episode. I just want to thank you guys because it's cool that this film gets to see some love. Yeah. I appreciate I, it. And not just this, but I mean, like you said, the whole SOV thing, the whole sub sub genre, the whole side genre of everything the the niche of the niche all has equal opportunity now and it's just yeah you couldn't ask for you can all get nostalgic about the video store days but come on you have Tubi you have YouTube you you type in the most random thing and you're likely it'll come up on one of these streaming things that's amazing or you can go online and and find a set like boarding houses that comes out and be like I've never imagined this happening, having this much access and stuff. Well, shout out to our friends over at Shutter, Craig Engler, who is the programmer over there. We had Joe Bob, the, obviously the last drive in. Yeah. Joe Bob and Darcy, uh, shout out to Darcy. How are you? They were able to do a screening of Sledgehammer. And I got to tell yeah, you, that was awesome. I, I, I was thrilled. I was like, oh my God. But again, it was polarizing. I was on, you know, it was heavy on Twitter during that screening because I had to be. And mm-hmm. I want, and people were like, they were either like, this is amazing or what are we watching? Oh, just to have that happen, a chance for that to happen now, it's so cool. And people loved it. And I will, I have a little bit of a gripe with the, the you know, I'm not going to go against Joe Bob's, you know. Joe was, Bob's expertise, but this is the first shot on video horror movie. Sorry. That's true. It's not the first shot on video horror movie that went straight to video. That was Sledgehammer. Okay. And that was shot on video night. And the second movie was, what was the second one? It wasn't even a shot on video. It was it was Things, yeah. which was shot on Super 8 and 16 millimeters. So, hey, I love The Last Drive-In. Don't get me wrong. I love all of that stuff. But uh, he did mention Boarding House, which was cool. Joe well, Bob did. The the thing that was cool to me was the shit eating grin on Joe Bob's face as he's showing the movie because he knows. And you know that he loves the movie, but he knows yeah. that it's going to be polarizing. Yeah. And I think that has become the problem with what we call cinema nowadays is it, there's a lack of divisive. I fucking love the new Halloween Kills. I thought it was dope as mm-hmm. hell. I thought it was campy. I totally got the tone. It, it was, challenged you, though. It kind of challenged your sensibilities. Yeah, that's what it is. And and. Did it did it kind of go against your expectations? The worst thing a movie can do is nothing. It's- exactly. Right. Yeah, if you want to talk about bad movies, think about how many fucking Reese Witherspoon movies or, you know, romantic comedies, Gerard Butler. Rom- like, come on. That's a fucking bad movie. Mm. All right? You know, how many White House down movies do you got? Mm. That shit. Mm. I, I Look, <laughs> that's my take. That's my fucking take. You want to talk about bad movies? Yeah. You could say Nomadland was a bad movie because a lot of people hated that movie. I thought it was good, but people are like, she drives around in a van and shits in a bucket. What the fuck am I watching, you know? Yeah. And they say that's a bad movie. <laughs> but it's easy to crap on a movie like Boarding House that doesn't look like Nomadland, doesn't have that beautiful cinematography, that Oscar-winning edit and direction and stuff. That's a bad movie to people, to a lot of people. And Halloween Kills is a bad movie to a lot of people. I could show on Golden Pond. Or Boarding House, and I guarantee you'll, yeah. you'll remember Boarding House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to watch right now? You're going to watch On Golden Pond, or you're going to watch Boarding House? Right now, viewer, uh, listeners, viewers? No. But now, guys, guys like you, and obviously 
you become the keepers of the flame. You're the ones who are like passing this on because there's a whole new generation of people who are just obsessive collectors. Well, well, yeah, I mean, that's, I have to mention Frank Sabatella, my partner on putting this out. He's a great director and producer on his own. I feel bad I didn't mention him yet, but Frank Sabatella and I partnered with this through Shanti Wintergate to get in touch with her parents, Kalisu and John Wintergate, to get this movie out because Frank and I just love this movie. We love it. Yeah. We knew other people loved it too, but it hadn't been released in quite a few years. And there's there's a lot of distributors like us who find sub-distributors to put these things out like we did with Agva Bleeding Skull. We're at a time now where if the fans don't put these things out, if we didn't go get the license from the filmmakers, this may have not have been released ever again or for a long time. And that's important. You know, it's yeah, it's up to us to, to put this stuff out. It's up to the fans to put these things out again. If you don't document it, folks, it didn't happen. Just right. remember that. You always just, hey, look, uh, when I initially conceived doing this episode, Sean has been one of my nearest and dearest old friends to both producer Pete and I. But when I conceived doing this, I said to myself, I want to give you something that you're not going to get on the DVD set. This was to be another, just another piece to the puzzle that is this film. Really quickly, would you mind, what am I getting? If I buy this right now, what am I getting? What's on this disc? Uh, the new Vinegar, that's on VinegarSyndrome.com. You can go there and get this. It's the Agfa Bleeding Skull release of Boarding House. And we get the theatrical cut, a 2K scan from the 35 millimeter print one of the original 35 millimeter prints Ooh. It, it had slight correction the most basic correction and fixes but leaving those scratches and that grain and that grime on there mm. was something that Joe Ziemba at uh at Bleeding Skull wanted to and we all wanted to have that kind of version on there where it's clearly a, a beat up 35 millimeter print of a video movie so you get that for the first time on home video you get the original home video cut, which is just called Boarding House. Both both the theatrical and the home video are called Boarding House. That's the one that you bought on the Paragon tape and on a lot of the bootleg tapes across the country. So that's two versions. There's commentary tracks for all the movies. There's a third cut of, the, of Boarding House called Psycho Killer, which is previously unreleased. It mixes up a few scenes, and the title is Psycho Killer. We have... 35 millimeter trailers, trailers, TV spots, a way cool unreleased second film by Callisu and John Wintergate called Sally and Jess, starring our friend Shanti Wintergate and her brother Cody Wintergate, and they're they're adorable in the movie. Little, it's it's a kind of a wilderness survival adventure Disney style, early 80s live action Disney style, but still has the psychedelic and spiritual influence of Callus and John Wintergate. And it's a really weird family movie shot in regionally and at their house in their hometown in uh, McCall, Idaho, which is really cool. And they use the, the house they built as a family. It's like the wilderness family movies from yeah. the early eighties, you know, yeah. like it was Swiss family Robinson. Yep. And then it became the wilderness family. It's yeah. like that, but it's definitely got some weird stuff going on. So we have that. We have a 2K scan of that 16 millimeter an answer print, and I did the um, audio commentary with uh, John uh, John Wintergate and Callisu for that movie. And that was uh, and and uh, producer sa slash seducer slash Pete. Pete oh yeah. yeah, Pete Bune helped with the audio commentaries. He's the audio guru here, so Pete Bune helped produce the audio commentaries for. Uh, Keep me crispy for all of these uh, wonderful commentary tracks. I mean, look, at, at, it's loaded. It's a loaded disc. It's yeah. a two disc set. I'm opening it right now. It's a value at twice look, the price. There's like three movies on each disc, and one movie that was never released, and and then two other versions of Boarding House that that were never released. And this Vinegar Syndrome dot com. I gotta tell you, folks, as a as a nerd, a film nerd, uh, what a time to be alive. No, you know what? It's so easy to uh, you know again, people of our age. It's so easy to pine for those. Those golden days of the, you know, nostalgic bullshit of the past. Mm. But now's the time. Yeah. It doesn't get better than this. Mm. The only problem is, is narrowing it down what you should be watching. Of course. Because I, I was thinking about this today, too. Again, growing up with Joe Bob driving theater, USA up all night, 
Commander USA. Oh, yeah. Uh, Elvira, you know, all these horror hosts. We kind of put the trust in those those people and those shows and those hosts to show us, to guide us to what we should be watching. We don't really have that. I mean, we have Elvira's back. Joe Bob has been back. So they're the stewards. They're the, the textbooks that we have that tell us, okay, this is cool. I've picked this out. I've been in this game for 40 years. I've done my homework. Check this movie out. You can go that route, and we had that route, but now you have Amazon Prime, and you go to the horror selection, and you can kill six hours easy without watching anything, just searching through titles. Well, the secret, You need some guidance. The secret for all of this, and this has been my big argument with any streaming network, the secret is programming and curation. It's the curation. That's and what it is. That's one thing, again, Shudder excels at is the programming oh, and no, curation. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Shudder has the best kind of interface as far as genre, subgenre, and the selections. Shudder does it right. They have Joe Bob there to do it, too. They grew up with that stuff, I'm sure. They, they learned from those pros on how to kind of guide you in the right direction. The folks at uh, AGFA, I did their virtual seminar, and it was very, it was very enlightening. For the simple fact that we talk about programming for a theatrical, you know, for a theatrical event. But, hey, you're doing the programming for your friends at home. And they yeah. teach you. They right. teach you, okay, well, you know, you go to a good movie marathon. Like, you know, they got a Dolomite movie. Maybe they got Boarding House. And you're like, oh, man, it's like a playlist that slaps. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's sign up to Exhumed Films, AGFA, Alamo Draft House. They're programming. Yep. There's so much more that I don't remember right now. But. Vinegar Syndrome, Agfa Bleeding Skull video. Most of these are just kind of blind buys because you're just like, I know this company. I know these these people who are making these selections, these curators. I'm trusting them, and I'm rarely disappointed, if ever. You're always going to, I will say, you're always going to get something that's interesting. Like recently, they just dropped New York Ninja. I haven't seen it yet. Right, right, I'm excited. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reality of it is, is for me, that's going to be a blind buy or a or going to a screening and it's a blind experience yeah, right? Um, because I trust that they, I trust their taste. Mm-hmm. And I think, and, and that's scary because these streaming channels and everything else or, or services, they want you to just consume. The reality of it is, is that if you have people that are advocates for these films, they say, this is why you should see yeah, this. Yeah. I don't know. It's, we need that. Yeah. We like do. shutter. We need shutter. And they're originals. Um, Frank Sabatella's The Shed was on there last year. That's <laughs> it's right. Like, tell us what's good because we're lost in a sea of Content. stuff that we can't. <laughs> I can't make heads or tails of. No. So I know I can go to Shutter. Yeah. I, and I'm guaranteed to be interested in something there. And narrow it down for me, please, because I. I'm old and I don't want to do that work anymore. In an endless sea of content, I got a couple of free trials lately, and. And, and I am a weird dude. Like, I like everything. I just went through this whole Paul Rudd romantic comedy rewatch. I finally <laughs> finished with Admission. And I can't believe how many wonderful people were attached to that film. And what a shitty film that was. That's a bad movie. That's a See? bad That's a bad movie. And and people don't think like, oh, it's a studio comedy with Tina Fey and, and Paul Rudd. It's It's got to be good. Yeah. No, that's a fucking bad movie. Yeah, it's not good. All right. <laughs> yeah, no. Show me Manos Hands of Fate. Yeah. Show me fucking Plan 9. I'll have endless fun with that. There's your advocate. And and even if you were a horror host back in the day, like, you might not have had access to that, even the B movies. No. You you might have had the crap. So you got to put it over, though. Well, now we have, you know, um, it's been so thinned out since that time I spoke of the 90s into the 2000s where the things are self-aware. But. It still happens. I mean, we have Tommy Wiseau. We have The Room. We have Neil Breen. You know, mm. these creators, they're the ones that come out and you're just like, is this a joke? Is this real? And then you do the research and you realize, no, it's a genuine effort from a filmmaker. And it's it's better than Admission. Mm. The Room. Come on. You watch Admission, this Paul Rudd movie, and then you watch Fateful Findings, Neil Breen. Mm. Which one are you going to watch again? Oh, probably. I'm, the, the I'm Neil gonna Breen. go Breen every yeah. time. I do love that handsome Paul Rudd, though. <laughs> no, I love I love all those. I, I love Tina Fey. I love you know. Of course, I got. And then you yeah. and then you have like Red Letter Media too. Thank God for them to kind of 
anytime they do a best of the worst or any kind of selection review, okay, I'm definitely going to check that out. Because there's a, you know, with Red Letter Media, there's a legitimate passion for film. That's why they do it. Yeah. You need that. And Joe Bob had that passion. Yeah. You know, or still does. I mean, he's, you know. The takeaway for people is even if you see Boarding House and you say, what a piece of shit, I hate this movie. Go out and make your own movie. And, and hey, that, that's what I always go. champion here is I try to be as positive as possible. And I will tell people, you hear a song and you think it's shit, go out and make your own song. Yeah. Do it. Go make art. And to me... Even the worst movie is a pain in the ass to make. Yeah. Pain in the ass. But do it. Yeah. Do it because you know what? You could be you could be the next Cecil Deba Miller. You could be the I, next Neil Breen. You could be the next... Uh, <laughs> John Wintergate. That's right. You know, I, yeah. Put up or shut up. Seriously. And I and you I know? like that. And, and don't try to make a bad movie. If you made a bad movie on accident, or not a bad movie, you made a, a, an unintentionally entertaining movie on accident, then you've succeeded better than admission yeah. did. You and, know? and you know what? <laughs> Best case scenario, in 1982, you make a fantastic film that is just so weird. There's really nothing else like it. There hasn't been before or since. Um, you couldn't make something like this now, even if if you tried your hardest, you couldn't make something as bizarre as Boarding House. You can't. No, it's it's one of those. It's a happy accident. That's what it is. Or or it's it's a happy kind of. Um, it's it, it was meant to be one thing, and now it's another thing. It's a happy that you know. Where where can they get this again? They where can, they can get this brand new set of Boarding House Blu-ray two disc deluxe set at VinegarSyndrome dot com. And you could also get, uh, we have a wide variety of Boarding House merchandise at BoardingHouseMovie.com. And you can get hoodies, you can get beanies, oh my t-shirts, God. you can get a Horror Vision trucker cap. Yeah, we got all kinds of stuff. And, and we're looking forward to 2022 with some really uh, phase two, some weird merchandise, another VHS release, a home video uh, VHS release of the 35 millimeter print. Uh, trading cards and wax packs, yeah. um, a whole bunch of fun, weird stuff uh, coming out in 2022 at BoardingHouseMovie.com. Excellent. You know, this is the Thanksgiving special. So it what is. are you thankful for, Sean? I'm thankful for <laughs> uh, for for you having me on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. First um, guest ever. Hell yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. Collector's edition. And it's going to be the last, I hope. You, that's it. I don't want to be compared it, to another guest. You know, Sorry. sometimes you hit a zenith and that's it. You got it like Seinfeld. <laughs> you got to get out while you're on top. I'm thankful for this amazing podcast that that you put on with with Peter Bune. And this, this is um, I'm a devoted listener now. Thank you. Um, obsessed with it. And uh, I'm thankful for the time that you gave me talking about Boarding House, man. And I'm thankful for the filmmakers of this weird, wonderful movie. Yeah, this is this was this was for you, but it's more for me because I'm such a nerd that I was like, yeah, well, who the hell else is going to talk about this movie? I don't know. But yeah. you know what? I I hope that some of our audience who might have seen more of the mainstream fare of the first season that they followed us on this journey and they're like, hey, you know what? This is it's different. I guarantee. And, and if they don't want to listen to it, it's not an official episode. So no, it's, it's the Thanksgiving special. It's homecoming. <laughs> It's the break. It's yeah. The spring break or no, it's not spring break. It's what is this? Winter break? Uh, whatever. Okay. It's holiday. It's All right. Yeah. Holiday break. Special. Holiday season. The go. reality of it is, is Pete, the producer, you, we've all been friends for a long time. Um, and I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of this set. It's incredible. It's everything. I mean, look, when you showed me this movie two years ago, two years ago, a friend of mine showed me Boarding House and I was like, oh, lost me. Um, no, but like you showed me this film two years ago and I was just like, it really reignited my passion. Yeah. And yeah. I think that I'm, there is a, there's a closed circle now for me because it, it's come back around. Now we're promoting this film. Yeah, you know? it's and weird. That's awesome. Right? It's great, and I appreciate your time. And and also, if, if listeners want to check out Boarding House and go down the shot on video rabbit hole, which is so much fun and just well, really a break from the normal. You got to start with Boarding House. Start with Boarding House, and then go on from there. Mm. Please do that. Go in that order. Yeah, and I mean, this is the time. This is this is the time to cash your chips in. Hey, look, next season, Craig, Craig over at Shutter. Joe Bob, Darcy. I know Darcy will fight for me. Let's oh, get, yeah. Let, let's get a BH here on the last drive-in. That the, would be neat. We got, you got to see the 35 millimeter version 
on Shutter on the last drive in that's for me somewhere. The, ta- the takeaway now for me is I want to see this on 35 because I'm just I'm a dirty hoe and I I have that's that's the way to see it. That's the way to see it. Just to see that weird three quarter inch video behind that that grain and sleazy scratchy grime of that 35 millimeter print is the only way to go. Can they book this film? Can they book it? Yeah, they can go to Agfa. Yeah, because they got all the trauma titles recently, and that's you know, fantastic. Agfa, they- go to Agfa Direct, and uh, there's the theatrical uh, arm of, of Agfa will help you out. If uh, anybody, uh, this is available for bookings right now. Yeah, there are nerds that listen to yeah. this show that that do programming and booking. Shout oh, the, out to you guys. The, the, the theatrical uh, engagement is underway. It's been secretly programmed uh, many times so far. Well, and, and we're going to have a lot more screenings in 2022. In the words of notorious anti-vaxxer Ice Cube. Yay, yay. <laughs> Folks. My... He turned down nine million bucks, but who cares? <sighs> he doesn't need nine million bucks, does he? Yo. <laughs> Will Ferrell turned, he just had this story recently where he turned down $25 million to do Elf 2. That's Wait, right. Wait, was more? It was 27, 28? It was oh, a lot. Wow. Oh, my God. Was it 30? Was it not 29 million? Yeah. Okay. 29 million turns it down. You know what, Will Ferrell? You're a better man than me. Yeah. I would have been calling fabs. I would have been like, "Yeah, we're gonna do this." <laughs> I don't care if I don't care if uh, what was the Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian. We'll do Elf goes Hawaiian. Who cares? All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, thank my guest Sean King. He has been fantastic. I hope that you're fantastic. I hope you and your family have a happy Thanksgiving, ladies, gentlemen, friends beyond the binary. My name is Jerry Hara. This has been the offering where I say my catchphrase. Mostly horror, always genre. Yeah, I did it. I pulled it off in the end. You got it. Yeah. We'll see you guys later. And again, happy holidays to you and your family. You've been listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. I'm very sorry. Produced by Pete Butte. If you have a question or a story you want to share with me, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit us up at Twitter at jerryhara or on Instagram at jerryhara. You get in the picture? Subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are provided for you and your family. I want you to enjoy. Just join us next time for another offer. I'm Tom. My partner Mike and I have been friends and co-workers for a long time. And at work, we're known for our daily water cooler conversations about TV shows and movies we are currently watching. Whether we're arguing over which Marvel TV show is the best or agreeing about which Netflix original movie is the worst, the pop culture conversation is always popping on Two Brothers at a Water Cooler. You can listen to Two Brothers at a Water Cooler on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are available. Subscribe and share today. This has been a Sick Boy Wolfgang production. Thank you for listening.